Okay, this is going to be an exciting update. It's been a while since I've touched Book.io and I have a special guest joining me here. This is Guillermo from Woodlands Pool, uh, uh, State Pool Tico Aspen. You can check out his pool, but he's also a fellow Cardano ambassador and also works for the Book.io team. So really happy to have him on here to talk through all these aspects, uh, not only just Book.io, but a little bit about himself as well. So Guillermo, welcome to the podcast. Hey Pete, great to be here. We've uh, we've run into each other at several conferences at this point. You're you're one of the few people I think that <laughs> I've met in person first, and then now we're doing sort of like interacting finally um, in, a, ah. in a digital sense. Um, yeah, I think we ran into each other maybe at uh, at Rare Evo a couple of years ago when it was I think rare when it was still Rare Bloom that the first uh, ever there. I think we ran into each other, and That's uh, right. yeah. So it's um, I've I've been following your channel and watching your content since before I even started the Woodland Pools channel. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be on here and thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, that was an absolutely fantastic event and it, it is really cool to actually meet the people in the ecosystem mm -hmm. as well. Um, Rare Bloom was a very cool event and hopefully I can get out there again uh, this year. I think uh, Rare Evo is in August this year, isn't, isn't yep. it? Yep. It's, it's mid August. Um, and so kind of weird, like we were just talking about, I, I'm doing kind of the digital nomad thing. And I'm, I think that I might be in New Zealand right before then. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to fly from Auckland straight to Rare Evo. So I live in the United States, but I'll be coming from your side of the world. So we can both be equally jet lagged if you if you come out. Yes, How about that? We'll have, yes. we'll have the same level of jet lag. That'll actually be really fun. Uh, I'll, I'll probably have an extra four hours uh, on top of that. But th there are flights from... Uh, Australia to New Zealand and then over to uh, cool. Las Vegas. So yeah. maybe I'll join you for a bit of skiing beforehand. You know, hey, that would yeah, be that'd actually be pretty cool. You can that'd actually really teach fun. me how to ski. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, that'd be a great time. So yeah, so it's uh, mid-August. I think it's like August 12th or something like that. But yeah, I'll definitely be there. Um, it should be a really good time. The, uh, Rand and Wes put on a really great event every year. And it's been really exciting to see their event grow and see how, how they've been kind of building that out and it gets bigger and, and better every year. I'm really happy for those guys. They've been absolutely crushing it. Now, I'd like to learn a little bit more about yourself and your journey into the ecosystem thus far, sure. and then suddenly working for the Book.io team as well, which which I think is uh, really exciting for anyone else that is wanting to work in yeah. the Web3 space. Like These are stepping stones that you can get uh, into a job in the Web3 space, and it's it's a similar story to my own. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into the Kadana ecosystem and how you got to where you are right now? Yeah, totally. So um, I guess taking a step back, um, I've been a web developer for about 10 years um, and um, about, let's see, I got involved in the Cardano ecosystem um, about three years ago or so um, after the Shelly hard fork happened in the summer of 2020, uh, you know, we were all like in, in lockdown mode for the pandemic. And, uh, and so I was like, well, I have all this free time. And I was like, and I know how to be a developer. I was like, I, I wonder what it would take to start a stake pool. And so in December of 2020, I started the Aspen stake pool. And so uh, that was my first sort of active participation in Cardano. I, I'd invested some and bought some tokens and stuff uh, before that uh, for a couple of years before. I think I started in like 2018, I bought some ADA. Um, but so in uh, the end of 2020, I started the Aspen stake pool. And then I think like many people find with stake pools, right? You, you think that the challenge is going to be the technical challenge, right? And so I <laughs> started the stake pool in December and I was like, great, it's up. You know, the delegators come on in and you're kind of you're looking around and you're just like, well, where is everybody? And so, it's not um, working. <laughs> yeah. And so then from there, I was like, okay, well, that's fine. So how do we make an interesting value proposition for folks that they would then want to delegate to the pool? And I looked around and, and there was uh, yourself with Lauren Cardano. Uh, I had seen Paul's channel, uh, Big Pay. So, so it's funny, like this generational way that it kind of like happens. I saw you guys and you guys had like these channels and you're covering all these projects and doing all this stuff. But for a lot of those channels, uh, I saw that like uh, from ITN days and on, it was then missing for a lot of folks like myself that were just coming in back to the basics of how do you make a wallet? How do you delegate to a pool and stuff like that? And so I was like, you know what? These guys are now so far ahead talking to project leaders and stuff like that. But some of the material on how you get these basics of like breakdowns of tutorials are getting kind of dated. And so I felt like there was a gap there. And so I started the Woodland Pools channel uh, to then help people get up to speed on what is delegation? How does a Cardano delegation cycle work? How do you pick a stake pool? Stuff like that. And very much the Woodland Pools channel 
was to be sort of a value proposition for delegating to the Aspen stake pool. I mean, you're very familiar with this, with, uh, you know, this is exactly the model that you and like Paul and pay have. Um, and so that went really well. So then, you know, um, we had the Woodland pools channel, the Aspen stake pool. And then during that time, as I kept getting more and more involved in the Cardano ecosystem, when we were leading up to then when smart contracts were launching, uh, I remember speaking to a friend of mine that had been very involved in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I was hanging out with him one day and I was, I was looking for a career change because I'd been with the same company for almost a decade, pretty much my entire web career. And, uh, and he was telling me, he's like, well, you know, you, you're, you're so interested in this Cardano stuff and smart contracts and you're looking to do sort of your next thing. He's like, why don't you just write smart contracts for Cardano? And I was like, <laughs> that never occurred to me. I was like, I don't know why I didn't think about that. And yeah. so um, at that point, I had already gone. I don't know if I had already gone or I was just about to go to the initial Cardano summit, the one that was in Wyoming. And so I was already going to all these things anyway and already covering all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. And so at that point, I quit my job and I spent about a year and a half transitioning from uh, web development into uh, on-chain validators and smart contracts. And during that time, between some freelance stuff and whatever else, I was able to like pay enough of my bills. I was also in the Peace Corps back in the day. And so I, whenever I need to, can still very much live like a Peace Corps volunteer. And so I don't spend very much, you know? And so I was like, okay, I was sort of on like a ramen noodle shoestring budget transitioning for a year and a half, learning how to write smart contracts and do stuff like that. And so I first uh, taught myself Haskell. Uh, then I went through the Plutus Pioneers program and I actually went through, uh, a lot of people give Emergo a hard time, but I went through Emergo's Cardano Solutions Architect program. And I thought it was fantastic. The only big thing that I would say about it, other, other than the price point, is that they still focus on Haskell. Uh, because at the time, Aiken was still sort of up and coming. And it was mentioned at the very end. But anyway, so I taught myself Haskell. And then when Aiken came out, then I started playing around with Aiken. But during that time, then I got like really up to speed on functional programming, Haskell, Aiken, all of that stuff. And during that time, because of the channel... I had been covering, uh, I saw, heard about this project that I thought was really exciting called Book.io. At the time, it was still Book Token. And so I made yeah, a couple of videos yeah. for the channel covering Book Token, what the project is, the value proposition. And in my mind, it was and still is the, the project that I was most excited about in Cardano. So I was like, okay, I, at this point, cover Cardano projects, you know, for a living, right? And uh, of all of them, this is the one that I find most interesting and most exciting. And so now I've been going through this whole period of learning how to write on-chain validators and to try and be um, helpful to a project in this space. I'm going to wait to see, I'm going to watch very closely and wait to see when those guys are looking for help and then I'll apply. And so, um, I was actually doing a road trip in uh, November of, it must've been at this point, what are we in 2024, 2022, I was doing a road trip and I passed through Dallas. I met the guys cause I'd covered them on the channel. I was like, Hey, you know, good to meet you. And a few months later they opened up, um, applications for a senior, uh, full stack engineer position. Uh, and then when I got the the code challenge for it, the challenge, because the full, the full backend that we do is all in Rust. And so when the code challenge came in, so I, I knew how to write JavaScript and TypeScript. I knew how to write Haskell. And I knew how to write Aiken. And then when the code challenge came in, the code challenge was in Rust. And I was like, well, I guess I need to learn how to write Rust now. And so I spent <laughs> probably 50 hours that week, just like yeah. heads down, didn't leave my office, just learning everything I could about Rust, submitted that back, uh, was fortunate enough to get the job there. And so I started with the book IO team in February of 2023 as a full stack engineer. Um, and so I should mention that before I became a web developer, I had uh, a full other sort of like career in project management, product management, internal operations. My degree is actually in industrial engineering, which is all about efficiency and productivity and stuff like that. And I'd worked with companies and like um, helped to grow and scale teams and like how do you onboard more people and build the culture of a team and stuff like that. And so when I came on board, I was already helping RJ, our CTO, with a lot of those different things. And so um, after a while, you know, RJ is the best developer I've ever worked with. Uh, and he was like, okay, but we need some help with like sort of operationalizing some of these different processes. And after a while, we're like, hey, do you want to just like make this a formal thing and I can just take all of that off your plate and I'll just handle all of that stuff for the engineering department. And so then about six months ago, um, we made it formal and I became VP of engineering at Book. And so it's been a very long journey from buying a little bit of ADA to starting a stake pool, to starting a channel, to meeting everybody at all these conferences, <laughs> to then, oh, I need to learn all yeah. these languages and then here. So it's, it's been a, I would have never guessed that it would have sort of played out in this way. Every step of the way has been like, oh, what's the next exciting thing that I can do? And okay, let's just do that then. Um, but I'm very, very fortunate. It's the best place I've ever worked. It's an incredible team. It's a, a unique match of people that are 
extremely capable and intelligent and great at what they do. And they're very driven to do this very exciting and sort of like paradigm breaking thing. And they're also just like the nicest people I've ever worked with. So it's just this, this trifecta. This is an amazing place to work. And I just uh, couldn't be happier. So I'm really, really glad it worked out that way. And yeah, still my favorite project in Cardano, which is good, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's an amazing story. Like to see that progression go through and just yeah. the, the timing of everything just seemed perfect. So it's, it's uh, fantastic that you're now VP of engineering there, uh, doing some amazing things, uh, helping with the, uh, the technic technical challenges that you guys are uh, delivering mm -hmm. and, and uh, releasing out to the ecosystem. So it's, it's uh, amazing to see you at this point now in the team. Mm -hmm. But I'd, I'd love to actually dig into now uh, mm -hmm. a little bit about what book I have been doing. Yeah. So first really. off, just give the listeners, I know there's some out there that are just wondering what on earth are we talking about? Mm -hmm. I love yeah. book 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 token when mm -hmm. I first like yeah. discovered it as well. Yeah. As soon as I yeah. read it, I thought amazing. But mm -hmm. can we get like a 30 second elevator pitch to yeah. define exactly what book IO is? Yeah. So, so with book IO, the notion is we give people for the first time ever, the ability to have true ownership of your digital assets. And so the easiest way that I think for people to think about it is this, like think about uh, eBooks and audiobooks that you buy either on uh, Amazon Kindle or on Apple's uh, book service or whatever else. When you buy a book, let's say you buy a book and you love it. And you're like, man, this book was so good. And you think that your really good friend or your wife would love it. And you're like, hey, you should read this book. Then they have to go and then also buy the book on their own account, right? Whereas we all know that like back in the notion, we all know like what physical ownership means where you would have bought a physical book and you're like, hey, I think you're like this book. And you just hand it to that person because you actually own that book and you give it to them and now they can read it. In the digital sense, we've never had that before because when we moved into the digital era at the time when like the internet and everything came up, there was no good way for in a digital realm to have an individuation like and sort of like individually mark each of these digital things. There's no way to really do that. But now with blockchain, we have the ability to do that with under the hood, it's NFTs and by their very definition, they are non-fungible, they are unique. So we can now uniquely identify these different, ass different assets that people are holding. And so for the first time ever, you have true ownership of your digital assets. And when you have a thing and you like it, you can then either lend it to somebody, you can sell it to them, you can give it to them for free. All the things that you know and like about physical ownership, we've now introduced that first with eBooks. Now we've been doing audiobooks. And all of that is in the Book.io umbrella. And then with our uh, new app that we're launching, Stuff.io, we're extending that into things like music and podcasts and other things like that. But if you think about it, the notion of the overarching piece that we call a, a, a DEA, a decentralized encrypted asset, it can really be anything. It could be uh, legal contracts. It could be anything that is something that you want to have stored in a decentralized way. It's encrypted so only you and another authorized person can read it. And it's an asset. It can be just any kind of thing of value that you want to have ownership of. And so, again, it could be books, music, ebooks, audiobooks, whatever. So, anyway, so that's, that's what we do is um, we, uh, we give people true digital ownership. Um, and it's a very, very exciting project. I, yeah, it's cool stuff. I remember when I could just have a ebook as a PDF and press mm -hmm. copy paste mm -hmm. and send it off to someone as well. But, you know, Apple brought in that whole uh, subscription model where you mm -hmm. had to use their ecosystem and their platform to actually read those eBooks. But Book.io, transforming that, turning it on its head, taking that kind of model, but then taking it further to have true ownership of your digital assets, I think is absolutely amazing. And when I heard that, I, I just knew that this is one of those Web3 projects that would take... Uh, the industry and have that high level of adoption uh, through the ecosystem. But how has it been going? Like since the launch, we've seen like a, a mm -hmm. token sale as well. Yeah. Uh, we've seen so many books launched through the platform. I am a collector of these books. I have so yeah. many of them. Um, I've read some. Uh, mm -hmm. Some parts of it, I, have, I, I have to say, tell Josh that I, I still haven't read a complete book yet, but I sure. have gone through and used the platform and read a couple of the stories here and there. But how has the ecosystem been going over the last couple of years? Uh, it's been great. And actually, if I can just touch on one last thing about the ownership piece that, that occurred to me as you were saying it is that the, the importance of ownership comes in two pieces. One is the ability to like have it and pass it around and do whatever. But the other piece is the 
trustlessness nature of it, right? Because exactly what you were saying about how with Apple or Amazon, you have to read it on their platform because you don't really own the thing. You just have a perpetual license to view the thing. And so the problem with that is that if either you or the author or the publisher get into any kind of a dispute with that platform, they'll just yank your access to it because you never really actually owned it. And so now the, the ability to like sell it and send it and lend it, that's really actually only uh, like almost like a, a nicety on top of the real thing, which is that nobody can take it from you. And the fact that it sits in your wallet and can only ever move out when you cryptographically sign for it, the same way how nobody can like take a book from your shelf in your house unless you actually, well, they break in, I suppose, but you know what I mean? Like, unless you actually give it to them. So yeah, I just wanted yeah, to like yeah. round that off. There's that piece <laughs> yeah. that a lot of people don't recognize that like, even if you don't want to ever send it to anybody else, because you don't truly own it, it's never actually really yours and it can also be taken at any time. So I think that's also an important distinction to call out. Yeah. Um, I think before we get into what's been happening in the book um, IO system as well, I, I, I've noticed like one of the book sales has been like a, the, the banned books. Mm -hmm. And yep. I, I think that's a really uh, important thing to bring up because there are yep. so many banned books. Uh, I, I think in the US where you are, the, you, you guys ban books like crazy. So uh, you could have a book that is, a, you know, a masterpiece of literature, yep. controversial, whatever, whatever you may say about yep. it. But um, because of whatever reasons in a particular state, it's banned. And then if you had that book, it would be ripped out of your um, app, your uh, Apple um, iTunes, mm -hmm. uh, Apple Books, and you will lose access to it, even though you've paid for it. But this well, negates that. And it could be right? more subtle than that, right? It can be more subtle than taking it. Right. What we're finding now is that some books are being outright banned where they're not allowed to be sold or owned or whatever, but some books are being rewritten. And what's happening is that they're oh. going in. And, yeah, oh, you didn't hear about this? Where they're going <laughs> no, in and they're changing, they're changing questionable language and they're actually changing the original, the words that the author originally wrote. So to your point, this is another piece too. You're, you're hitting all the good points because the other one is that like not so there's the notion where um, it is uh, yours as permissionless. So you don't have to ask any permission. It's trustless, right? Like you um, don't have to then like trust that a, a third party is going to validate that you can like send it or do whatever. But the other piece of the fact that it's on a blockchain means that it's immutable. And so it can't be changed. So not only are we providing access to people to buy books that there's actually also a cool thing to think about, like when it comes to like the religious texts that we were selling, it doesn't matter what your religion is. There's some countries where you can't even buy these religious texts and like, get access to them at all because at a nation state level, they're illegal. And so now you have access where you can now have access to own and have this thing that you might not have been able to get otherwise. But when it comes to these like more controversial books, the book that you buy with a text that is written will forever be that way because of the immutable nature of the blockchain, which is a really great thing. And so we're all very strong believers that to your point about like controversial books that may have been written a long time ago, you know... I think it's better that, for example, let's say uh, we sold uh, Huck Finn by uh, Mark Twain, right? There is like things about like questionable language or scenes or whatever else that are in that book. And I think as a society, right, like as a, as a, like a human culture that is advancing and moving forward, I think it's a much more interesting conversation to say, hey, here's this book that is a classic for a lot of different reasons. It has parts of it that are questionable and dated and whatever. So let's have a conversation around how things have changed since that time to now, right? And yeah, we as a society don't like some of these things that are here. So let's talk about why we don't like them and why it's not a good thing for these things to be that way versus silently changing the language in the background and pretending that it never happened. It's a, it's a very... 1984 kind of feeling when all of a sudden like the book that you're reading isn't exactly what Mark Twain actually wrote, right? It's a ministry of truth kind of thing that's kind of like kind of scary to think about from a dystopian standpoint. I don't want to get into conspiracy theories. Yeah. Either, but it's like, it gets kind of sketchy really fast, right? So uh, it's, it's a much more mature conversation of like, let's pass the real thing around and have conversations about it. So yeah, the, immu the immutability of it is a really big deal. I, I didn't hear about the changing of the literature yeah. of the books. That is yeah. extremely interesting. But yeah, I, I think yeah. Uh, a mature society would sit down and uh, analyze literature. It's, it's a part of history. It's, it's, uh, I know there's a lot of places that do like to rewrite their own history and yeah. uh, change it for their perspective to, uh, 
you know, show who the hero of the narrative is now. Um, unfortunately, that does happen. But uh, you're right. With something like this, we can make sure that um, history is there to stay and we can learn from history. It's really mm -hmm. important that you do look back and uh, learn from mistakes in humanity and take it a step further. Uh, we're getting a little bit philo philosophical here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that's all right. You know, that, that's that's what books are for, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of this whole thing, right? People read to like learn things and gain insights and things. And sometimes it's just, it's a fun sort of escape thing to just like, just read a fun thing that doesn't have to be any deeper than that. But yeah, I mean, this is exactly the kind of stuff that, um, that books are for, you know, to, to kind of like to, to inspire these kinds of conversations. And it's difficult to inspire thought provoking conversations if you're sanitizing all of the thought provoking parts that might be a little mm. bit uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we've, we've seen revolutions caused by books in yeah. history. So uh, it's a very interesting thing. And, and uh, I can see why governments try and ban certain books. But mm -hmm. let's get into... Let's go back I to your question. You, you, you <laughs> question like 10 minutes ago about yeah. how things are going on in culture and we've done all this other... You know, and I'm glad we covered these things. But let me answer your actual question that you were asking about um, how things are going with the community and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we are very fortunate that we have a very strong community that I think, you know, I think our community right now is sort of comprised of like uh, an overlap of like two different groups. You've got your people that found us because they were into already into the community of NFTs in general. And they're like, oh, okay, this is like another NFT that I can invest in. And then the other group that we have, that's very, very, very strongly active in our community are folks that are strongly philosophically aligned with the notion of digital ownership and this immutability that we were just talking about and being able to access information and art and things like that. Um, and so I think our strongest advocates are the ones that have kind of that overlap that like are philosophically aligned with it. And they like, they love the idea of being able to have these collectible covers and things. Cause we're doing uh, right now, most of the mints that we do are collectibles and our sort of our collectible series with limited number of books um, where we'll have different uh, covers on them. Sometimes there'll be unique covers, like one of ones. And so it's sort of a collector's mindset. And so that's what I mean. Like some people are like looking at it from a collection standpoint. Some people are looking at it from a philosophical. Some people are really interested in both. And those are our strongest advocates. Um, but we've been very, very fortunate that for whatever different reasons that people show up, we've had a very, very strong and active and vocal community that keeps showing up and has been supporting us in that way. And actually along those lines, um, on in just uh let's see here in 15 days on uh, april 20th on 420 we're doing our first uh ever book con it's going to be in mckinney texas which is where the office is held and it's going to be a fantastic event uh charles hoskinson is going to be there and he's going to be speaking from like the blockchain side of like what this can mean in terms of what blockchain can do but we also have a lot of partners and investors from the publishing side and so we're going to have people from the publishing sector let me uh <laughs> mute my computer here but like from the publishing sector we've got uh folks that are coming out that are going to be talking about what they believe this means for publishing and for what it means in terms of like from just the notion of forget the technology of it just for books what this can mean um and then also for a lot of these really strong community uh advocates a chance for a lot of them because they're distributed all over the world to meet each other in person for the first time, the same way how you and I, you know, met in uh, in Colorado. There's folks we have we have folks in in uh, Australia, uh, all over Europe, you know, several in the United States, and so for all of them to be able to meet each other is going to be really really great. So, uh, and then obviously Ben and Josh will be there talking about the notion of book and where it can go and stuff like that. So, the community has been really really great and really strong, and we're incredibly appreciative of them. And this next sort of era that we're moving into, and that's some of the things that we can talk about in terms of what's coming up and, and what we're focusing on, this next sort of era that we're moving into is like, so then how do we now go from a collector's mindset of like people buying things because they think that the unique cover is really cool and, and they value it uh, in that way and they are fans of the project, how do we move outside of that to people that don't care that it's on blockchain, don't care what the cover looks like, and we and then their value proposition is give me something that is the same or better of an experience than what I can get on Amazon or Apple. And that's why I'm here. 
I don't care what your company is called. I want to be able to buy a book that is at a similar price point that has a similar or better interaction than what I get in these other platforms. And so then that is now what we're trying to move to with that sort of sense of, of mass adoption of how do we make the best book platform on the world that gives you the ability to, with all the things that you and I just discussed, gives you the ability to not only buy and read a book and have a great experience, but then when you're done with it, because you actually own it, send it to somebody else, sell it if you're done with it, lend it to a friend, and recall it back whenever you want. That's sort of the next big step that we're moving towards. And all the initiatives that we're building out right now are with that in mind and trying to target those goals specifically. Yeah, it's that goal of mass adoption and bringing in more people into the ecosystem. It, I will get into some of these technical aspects uh, and what you guys are delivering and building for the platform in, in a moment. Uh, but um, that, that whole idea of bringing in more books to the ecosystem, I, I know a lot of the books that are being minted now are... Um, uh, I don't know what the term is called, but they're, they're old books that you can publish on the platform. Oh, uh, public domain. Public domain, that was it. Yep. So a lot of the books that you are publishing right now are public domain, but uh, mm -hmm. to, to really get mass adoption, you want to be able to print and publish books that are popular right now, that are selling yep. through authors yep. right now. Totally. I know one of your uh, um, partnerships that you have, I think also one of your investors is Ingram Publishing. Mm -hmm. yep. Can we talk about that yep. relationship and uh, what we could possibly see from them as an established publisher at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Super exciting because that's the kind of stuff that we're working on every day. And so yeah. Ingram, um, you're right, has was an early investor uh, and advisor and partner that we've had for a while now from the very beginning. Um, and for them, what they want to see from their side is a few things. Some of them are technical, but more from a practical sense. They're like, okay, before we give you access to all of our books, we need you to create an experience that someone's mother or grandfather or whatever can interact with and they don't have to know or care about blockchain, right? And so for them, two of the biggest things is easy account creation and um, being able to purchase the book in a way that someone's familiar with, which translates to just basically using your credit card, right? Yeah. And so that for them is a requirement they have set from like a user experience standpoint. And then from a technical standpoint, let's say that that that's you know green light is checked and let's go right. Then from a technical standpoint, to your point, but then how do you then uh, bring these things in? That is where um, we have a really interesting technical integration that we've been doing for a while now. Where without getting too low level, all different publishing companies all have their feeds of all their books that they have available for eBooks in a format called Onyx. And you can, if you set up your integration correctly, you can tap into this Onyx feed and then consume and ingest their whole catalog right through that feed. Whoa. And that brings in all of the eBooks, all of the, you know, everything about it, the EPUBs, the, the fully ready to go readable thing, right? So what we've been doing now over the past several months, and it's actually completely feature ready from our side, ready to ingest, is building an Onyx ingestion engine so that we can then take all of those books in. So from a technical standpoint, we're ready to go to do that ingestion. So then it comes to the requirements from the publisher standpoint of the user experience of, okay, so now how do we make it that then people can then come and, and actually do that? I suppose there's one last sort of technical piece that remains that's this notion of what we call mint on demand. Because if you think about it right now, whenever we do mints for books and this collector's sort of mindset, it's all prepared ahead of time where we say, okay, here's all the covers. Well, obviously here's the EPUB. That's like a, a singular thing, but here's all the covers. Here's the rarity charts and all these things. And we kind of package all of this stuff together. And then there's going to be a mint of this many books and you get everything ready. And we mint it, you know, uh, on the fly when a user is actually kind of doing it. That's how we uh, do the rarity and all of that. But if you think about it, you can't really do that kind of thing when you're when you have a catalog of 10,000 books, right? What you need to do for that is just literally kind of just, you know, instead of trying to mint 500 books at a time and they sell out in 3 or 4 minutes, right? Instead, the idea is if you've got 10,000 books that people can choose from and you sell one of those today and two of those and one of that guy and one of this one, right? And so with that, you need first the injection from the Onyx side uh, the ingestion from the Onyx side, and then the notion of mint on demand, where then whatever somebody picks, we bundle everything on the fly for them to be able to do that. And so I can talk more about how the mint on demand is going to come along, but we can get to that. But the other piece now from the user experience standpoint is how do we make it easier for people to come on board? And so the two big things that are involved with that 
is a uh, social login. So folks can log in with like Twitter, Facebook, Google, whatever, and don't have to worry about making a username or password. And then uh, once they're in credit card payments, so they can just pick the book that they want and pay with a credit card. And actually I will say even one step between that is how do then they pay for the thing and have it show up in their account without them having to link an, uh, uh, an eternal or Typhon wallet or something else like that. And then that's where we've also already rolled out this feature of what we call self-directed wallets, where we create a wallet for the user that is a fully functioning crypto wallet with a recovery phrase and everything. With the best of both worlds where it is fully functional, if they want, they can view the seed phrase and extract it, uh, but they don't ever have to know what that is or how it works. And on top of it, from a security standpoint, we don't have access to that seed phrase. They create a pin when they make it, and that pin is used to encrypt their seed phrase and store it. And the only way that anybody can ever see that seed phrase again is when they put their pin back in, that's how it presents it. So you log in with social login, we create a wallet for you on the fly, and then you pay with your credit card. And so in none of those things, do you have to even know that crypto or blockchain was involved at all. And then you just get your book, right? So all of these things are right around the corner. And when I say that, I mean, on the order of days and weeks now, like we've been working all this for a while, and it's all sort of coming together. Um, and we're very, very excited because we have all of that ready. The Onyx ingestion is ready. And then now we need to finish rounding off minting on demand, which we can talk a little bit more about later. But it's getting very, very close then. So from an Ingram standpoint, how do we get access to these 10,000 titles and be able to start minting books that, like you said, are popular today and that are with like living authors that have royalties and things with their publisher? So it's Ooh. a lot. Yeah. It, it sounds like uh, this is all ramping up for that book con. So uh, yeah. I, I suspect you, yeah, yeah, you're working towards a deadline so you can have something big to reveal at the conference, right? That's yeah. that's the idea. Um, how many titles does Ingram have? Like, uh, And uh, what, what type of um, authors are going through there? Can, can you name a couple off the top of your head? Because, um, you know, it, the name Ingram doesn't really ring a bell for a lot of people. Uh, it, it, people may not even realize that uh, Ingram Publishing uh, published. Well, and actually, uh, so I will say, sorry, I guess, yeah, I guess we're, sorry, I've completed two things. So Ingram is, uh, is the actual printing company. They're the ones that we would use oh, for I mint see. and print. Yeah. Yep. And then Bertelsmann, which has BDMI, which is an investing arm. Uh, Bertelsmann is the company that actually owns Penguin Random House. So if you've ever like gotten a book and you see a little penguin on the back, all yep. of those are owned by uh, Bertelsmann and BDMI. And so those are like where um, we'd be able to like ingest that. And so, but from the Ingram side, the other interesting thing there is that once we have Mint and Print Live, which we can also talk more about if you'd like, we can also do an ingestion with them for their, for their whole uh, print on demand catalog, where we can then basically be a, uh, like a, a retail store also for physical books that instead of going to Amazon and buying it, you buy it through us and they get fulfilled and printed by Ingram. So, sorry, that was my fault. Um, we kind of mixed up two different, um, two different companies there on, on different sides of the publishing industry, but it's, um, it's, uh, the, the Bertelsmann side and ping a random house. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of titles that they have access to. I don't know specifics gotcha. of gotcha. which, which, but it's, yeah. it is, yep. if I'm not mistaken, I want to say they are the largest publishing company in the world i think it's it's huge so yeah oh, you're probably right there i i don't know I'll, I'll check i'll check that and put some some stats up on the screen just to to yeah. see where they're ranked uh, i'm but, sure i'm sure like ben ben will come after me and and uh and correct something. <laughs> yeah, so, so ben comment yeah. comment down below what i've gotten wrong ben and we can uh <laughs> we can fix it that way i'm on the tech side i don't know man but it's like but yeah it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Very, i know that it's a lot of books and it's very very exciting that's what i know well, I, we can also say that the the whole publishing industry has so many different layers. So yeah. it's it's very deep and technical in itself. And um, you know, you, you guys have been working in the uh, the publishing industry, the book publishing industry. Um, I think uh, uh, Josh said since like two thousand nine or something like that. Yeah. So Ben and Josh have both been in the publishing industry for a long time, and so they have a, a long background uh, with these different companies. And that's why I think it's also worth mentioning, right? We're we're kind of joking about conflating these two things, but it's important to mention that they are two separate things that are both very important because on the one side, we have the ability to uh, ingest and start selling all of these eBooks. And on the other side, uh, Ingram, like I said, is the largest book public uh, book printing company in the world. So whenever you go to like Amazon and you buy a book, it is very high likelihood that the book that you're buying, uh, like your physical book that you're buying to get shipped to your house is not sitting on an Amazon warehouse somewhere. 
What's actually happening is when you hit buy, the order goes out to Ingram. They make the book for you on the fly in real time and print exactly one copy, put it into an Amazon box and ship it to your house. And so they already have wow. all this infrastructure. I mean, it's amazing. They, they print more books than anybody else in the world. And so you've got the largest publisher in the world and the largest uh, book printer in the world. And we have uh, relationships and we're building integrations with both of them. So it's very, very exciting. Wow. 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 Okay. I had no idea they did that. Uh, uh, Printing on demand. I always thought they printed like, you know, millions of copies and just sent them around for distribution. Well, uh, and so they can do both. And they can do both. Right. So for example, like when textbooks are being printed, they might print thousands and thousands of them. Right. But at the same time, they have a very well refined print on demand service. And so that is where uh, our mint and print service that we're waiting to launch that's where somebody will buy an ebook, and then from there they can then click on print, and uh, they'll verify that they own the thing. And then with, with our integration with Ingram, then you can actually get shipped to your house a physical copy version with your unique cover that was on your ebook, and all that's fulfilled by Ingram because they already have all the infrastructure for print on demand. It's really really cool, and that from our Crazy. side. That code is completely written and ready to go. I actually wrote that myself. So that's like written and ready to go and totally done. Um, We're now just waiting on the actual like integration with Ingram to like go live and for some legal things we're working through and stuff like that. Um, But it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's right around the corner as well. It's really cool stuff. Before we get into the the mint on demand side of things and those tech things, mm-hmm. there, there was one really interesting tweet that I think I saw about a couple of months ago. I think it was from Josh and he was having a meeting with some other publisher or printer and there was, they were saying something about uh, one of the features of Book.io. Uh, we don't care about the stats about what people read and you know we don't care about that type of information. But it, do, it sounds like Ingram would be really interested in those stats because then they can yeah. optimize their printing workflows. Um, yeah. ha- has there been like struggles to try and sell the platform on some of these like uh, uh, web two features where you do have these type of analytics and stats mm-hmm. and trying to change and convince the publishers about that kind of uh, usefulness of some of the things that you guys are bringing into the industry? Well, and so that's, that's part of what, is makes the whole thing so well-rounded and interesting as a novel solution. Because a lot of times when we're having conversations about this stuff, like between you and I or anybody else, we immediately focus on the entire value proposition for the consumer, right? Where it's like how you can own the thing, you can tie it to a physical copy and print it if you would like or whatever else. But there's an equally compelling other side that is completely novel and very exciting for the publishers and the authors. Because all of this stuff that comes with the fact that this truly is actually on the blockchain under the hood presents multiple, but two off the top of my head, very interesting things. Um, The first one is for an author, if you think about, so now we talked about how we're trying to bring in digital ownership to bring all the great things that we know about physical ownership, try and make them digital, right? Now, once you've reached that parity, we can actually also introduce additional features that physical ownership could never do, but because of the digital realm and its traceability and things like that, you can do that are really cool. And so one of them, for example, if you're an author, you write a book that does very, very well, and it you know continues selling for decades, right? That book that you've sold, you only ever make money from it the first time that it sells. And then when it goes to a used bookstore or whatever else, like we were just talking about how you can sell it to somebody or whatever else, in all of those cases where there's used bookstores all over the world, that initial author and publisher never see any more funds from that ever again. But with it being on blockchain and being with an NFT, we can now put in place royalties where the author then continues getting a small cut of every secondary sale that ever happens in perpetuity. So now becomes a model that's much more of like how you think about famous TV shows and things where they hit syndication and they play on reruns forever. And then some of those people just live off of reruns for the rest of their lives. You know, (laughs) yeah. if an author writes a book that's good enough, then they can be in that kind of situation where they're just getting these royalties basically paid in of all secondary sales that are happening. So that's a really, really strong value proposition for the author. And then for the publisher, and also for maybe very uh, actively involved authors as well, there's also the the piece too of your point of, of analytics, where you can see how much a book is selling for, uh, its velocity of how often it's selling. Um, you can see the distribution of how many wallets are holding it. For authors, you can do really cool things, right? Where you can start looking at 
okay, I'm an author. I've written 10 books. How many wallets have all 10 of my books? And then you could do things like airdrops and things to loyal fans and send only your most loyal fans the latest book that you've written or maybe a thank you card that you wrote by hand or something, right? And so uh, th this is all the notion of how blockchains, the, the data in them is public and everything on them is pseudonymous, right? Where it's uh, it's not fully anonymous because you can see everything on the on the ledger, but you don't know who it corresponds to. So you do have that level of privacy where nobody knows that address ABC, three, four, five, seven, whatever is Pete, right? But from a high level data anonymized aggregation standpoint, authors and publishers and things can make strategic decisions based on this aggregated data because all transactions in the blockchain are public. So it's very, very interesting also from the business side, completely independent from all the value that it brings to the consumer side. So it's a really, really cool and sort of well-rounded value proposition in that way where both sides find it enticing to do. Yeah, most definitely. So many benefits there for uh, the mm -hmm. consumers and the businesses. So I'm really excited to see, uh, you know, publishers and authors take advantage of those. And uh, eventually we see some authors like uh, uh, excited and tweeting about how they just airdropped, um, uh, you know, a preview copy of a book or something to their uh, loyal followers, their loyal uh, readers out there. So, you know, when, when you guys get to that point and authors start doing that, it would be amazing, amazing to see. Yeah, I mean, but, right now, right now we're already doing things where like uh, we can do things again that, that you can't do uh, in a physical sense. We do things already where uh, authors, for example, offer discounts on a book where it's like we have, we have one author, for example, Joe Nassis, who's minted. He's an independent author who owns full royalties to his own work. And so that's the other thing to do. We have a lot of public domain books, but we also have a lot of independent authors that, that fully own the rights to their books. And they've come to us as like a portal where they can like publish their things. So for example, Jonas Cease has written, I want to say he's published at least three books with us now. And uh, what's cool about that is then you can also do a rewards reel, but some of them, the rewards can be monetary where you say, hey, if you have all three of my books or one of them or whatever, you can get a 30 or 50% discount on buying the next one because we can do requirements for discounts on, on some of these mints and things. So there's a lot of really interesting things you can do along those lines. Right, super exciting for authors and uh, that level of engagement. Um, now let's go through some of these technical aspects and sure. what you guys have been building and making these uh, ex user experience and everything else really, sure. really nice for our users. So this mint on demand thing sounds uh, sounds simple from my point of view as a user of minting, yeah. right? I just go to the website, mint, bam, there we go. Yeah. But all the work behind it is quite technical and uh, you guys must have yeah. spent a lot of time behind it. Can we talk through so, that whole mint on demand thing? Yeah. So if you think about it, it's, um, it's interesting because from a technology standpoint, like for anybody that's worked in any kind of a technology company before, um, especially with startups, what you find is that there's a lot of things that you do that start off as very manual processes and they're maybe disparate manual processes. And you'll just kind of like fire off this one when that's done, then you do this one. And then when that one's done, you take the result of that and you fire off this one. And so then if we think about sort of like how we start aggregating these things and how they start evolving and maturing, the next step that you do is maybe you write like a script that fires off that one, then waits for this and this and this. So now you only fire off one thing that's all of these things, but you still need a very technical person to be doing this stuff, right? Now, then the next layer you do on top of that is you maybe make a, a, a very simple internal facing user interface where then somebody can like drag and click and point and fill in the fields and it'd be filled in, which kicks off a script, which does the different things, right? And so um, in, in the process of how we actually prepare these books and mint them and get them ready, we're now sort of at that third step that I was talking about, where we are slowly transitioning the process of uh, first preparing and then actively minting and selling uh, digital assets to the point where now we're slowly handing more and more of those things over to the marketing team so that engineering is no longer even involved in minting books at all. And we're, we're really close at this point to doing a full handoff of those things. It's, it's right around the corner at this point. Um, so then once you have that and you don't need an engineer involved at all, and it's all automated and running by folks on the commercial and marketing side. Now, if you think about it, you're now only one level of abstraction removed from a user showing up and saying, hey, I want to do these things, right? But now the piece that's missing there is that uh, even still at this point now, we already have the, the EPUB, we have the covers and stuff like that. And there's still some internal processes that bring those things together. Um, but where you, where you get to at the next point is then have a user be able to show up to a, a nice polished consumer facing website 
where they plug in the name of the book and how many they want to mint and they upload their own EPUB and they upload their own covers and with all that and they say, okay, mint. And then now it's a mint that's available, you know, for people to sell. So once you get to that point, now you're only just one more level removed from then doing a true mint on demand where instead of like specifying how many you want to mint or whatever else, you just leave it completely open-ended and you say, we have all the assets that we need across all these different books. And so now anybody can show up and it no longer even requires a user's interaction. It all compiles itself in the background and makes the mint and mints one book for you. Similar to how, how Ingram prints one book for you, we would now mint exactly one book for you instead of having to prepare a whole run of 500 or a thousand of them or whatever. So that's sort of how these steps all kind of work together. And we're right now at the internal part of the handoff from engineering to marketing and the business side. Um, but these things are very much incrementally building on each other to get to an independent author self minting portal. And then from there, uh, mint on demand, it's, it's, it's going really well. That's amazing. I love yeah. that explanation as well, breaking down all those different yeah. levels to take it to that full mint on demand uh, experience. So th this is yeah. really, really cool. And you guys are, have been working hard to get to this point and uh, mm -hmm. uh, where it is now. Um, uh, you, you mentioned that it was all close. Exactly how close? Like when will we see this uh, potentially la launched? Uh, well, this, yeah. This so, year, um, so what was that? This what was year maybe? Part? Uh, that's, that's definitely the goal. Yeah. I, the, this year, what are we in March, uh, April? Yeah. That's definitely the goal that at the very least we'd have one of those two things for sure, either mint on the man or the self publishing portal or both, because we're at the point right now where, okay, so if we want to take a step all the way back down to this lower level, there's the two pieces that happen. The first one is the, um, preparation and sort of, um, let's call it the aggregation of all the different parts that go into a book, uh, the EPUB, the cover, um, some of these other pieces that, that go into it, like the chapters and things like that. That is what we internally call Sprout. And Sprout is what sort of puts everything together and gets everything ready to be minted. Then the other piece that we have is called Parliament. And Parliament is the piece that uh, the user actually interacts with. It handles the minting and the actual like, okay, you, you, you're waiting in the queue. You have a reservation. We've got a book for you. We've accepted your payment. And now we send it to your wallet, right? <clears throat> so... Um, we have now, uh, we're at the point now where we've fully automated and handed off the Sprout process. And we're currently in the process of fully automating and handing off the Parliament process, which is in the order of, let's say, weeks to, to months from being ready, like a couple months from being ready, let's say. And then from there is where we need to build that next level of abstraction of once that's fully running and tested, then how do we make it that we can then ingest these things on the fly? Uh, but if you think about it, like if, if this internal stuff is already fully running without engineering in the next weeks to months, I think it's very reasonable to say, um, that within this year. And so and with, if Josh is watching this, he's probably like saying like, yeah, man, it better be this year. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, so, uh, so there, so Josh, leave a comment down below and let, let me know when this is supposed to be out. Um, because right now, like, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of these things that we're focusing on about the ease of onboarding. Um, but there's so many different things that we're trying to build and so many different priorities that we're trying to work with for some of this stuff that, um, it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to keep track of all of it. Um, but, but yeah, it is, it is very, a very present thing that I think, uh, folks will see sooner rather than later. Or when the devs put a timeline on their work, uh, you have to commit to it now, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why we <laughs> yeah. don't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. you know? it's like, uh, yeah. That's, you know, um, which is an interesting philosophical thing, right. In terms of, we, we talk about that some other time in terms of like uh, RJ and I put a lot of thought into, the philosophy of how to run a very productive and uh, happy engineering team, you know? And so one of those things that, that we feel very strongly about that we talk about a lot is take the time to find the best possible candidate that you can and somebody that is very driven in the work that they do. And so if you know that they're as good at their job as they can be, and you know, they're working as hard as they can, then if something's taking longer than it should, it's not for lack of ability or lack of interest. It's because either it's a harder problem than you realized or other things have gotten in their way, right? And so that's one thing that we both feel very strongly about is sort of protecting the team from what might be uh, unfair expectations of like, well, you just need to code more or code faster. It's like, dude, we already found the best person in their field who is super driven to make this happen. We need to just either remove roadblocks or change the scope or change our expectations of timing. And so that's that's sort of the way that we run the team. And it's, it's how we've been able to build and keep a very productive and very happy engineering team. And it's a thing that we feel very strongly about. We, we could talk some other time about philosophy yeah. of, of building happy teams, <laughs> uh, which I'd be happy to talk about. But that's, you know, that's, that's yeah. part of why for that stuff, we 
we don't necessarily try and nail down dates because it's to a certain degree, we'll be ready when it's ready because we've hired the people that we know can build it and we're trusting them to do the work right, you know. Okay. Does sound like a happy dev environment for sure. It's uh, yep. definitely a place where um, I, I think uh, our team would thrive as well, that kind of philosophy. Now, with the with, with some of these other aspects around onboarding users, one of the latest features I saw was being able to use your credit card directly yep. on the platform to mint on Cardano, which is super exciting. And this, yep. um, uh, I think you posted just the other day. Can we talk a little bit about this? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting. So, so with that is um, what is this notion of what we're calling a payment engine and a minting engine, right? So um, where they're two separate things, where you have a way that you can handle um, accepting different kinds of payments, different types, and then you can also handle minting DEAs of different types of DEAs, uh, eBooks, audiobooks, and also across different chains. And the cool thing about building these things as separate engines is that they are independent from each other. So you could then pay with whatever you want and mint on whatever chain you would like, potentially, right? Theoretically. And so you could have, for example, a, a mint. There's, there's no reason from a technological standpoint when you build it out this way that you couldn't, for example, mint a book on Cardano, but pay with Ethereum if you wanted, right? Or, or mint a book on Polygon, but pay with your credit card. Or mint a book gotcha. on Algorand and pay with Book Token, right? Because these things don't need to be together. Like it sort of clicked in our head where it's like, we had this conflation where, because something is on a blockchain, you need to pay with that chain's currency. And those two things don't need to be tied together. They are separate concepts. And so we've built out this notion of a payment engine and a minting engine. And the first iteration of that, of this separation, is uh, fiat credit card payments on Cardano. And so even though this will be multiple payment methods on multiple chains, because it's credit cards on Cardano and, da uh, and RJ is a dad, uh, his most excellent dad joke in a while was that he named it credit Cardano. And so that's what we've been calling it internally <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is instead of like, it's like this, it's this really cool thing. It's this payment engine, this minting engine, but we're just calling it credit Cardano for now because it's credit first manifestation Cardano. is credit card payment <laughs> on Cardano. Um, so sure. yeah, so we're really, we're really excited about it because it makes it much more approachable. But then also too, if you look at that video, it's, uh, so for those that are interested on the, the Woodland Pools, uh, Twitter account, uh, I, I tweeted out that video and actually Pete retweeted it. So you can see it on his account as well. There's two parts of it that, that make it interesting. The first part is that you just click the book that you want and you pay with your credit card through Stripe. But the step that happens before that is the one that we were talking about, which is a feature that's already live right now, which is, uh, the notion that how you get to that point is with a self-directed wallet so that you show up and then we say, hey, if you want, you can paste your Cardano address. But if you want, we'll just make a Cardano wallet for you. Just pick a pin and we just do it. So in that demo video, if you see, everybody was focused on the credit card part. But what happens before that was I deliberately did not paste a Cardano address. I clicked create wallet. I put in a pin and then I said, hey, we made a wallet for you. And then the, uh, the book was actually sent to that wallet's address. The user is able to view their book and read it on the Book.io platform. But if you were actually to go on the Cardano blockchain to the wallet address that corresponds to the wallet we made for that user, you would actually see that book sitting there. And then the user has the ability, if they were to choose, to then view the seed phrase and, and do whatever they want in Eternal or wherever else. But um, So it's a combination of two very exciting things. It's the abstraction of that. So it just looks like, oh, this is just my Amazon bookshelf and I have a book here. When in reality, it's actually truly living on chain in a, an address that you control the keys to. Um, and you bought it with a credit card. So it's really, really exciting stuff. And so that's something I've been working on. That's another cool feature that I got to build um, from a full stack standpoint, from uh, the front end web client to all the server stuff to the Stripe integration. Um, very fun. And I've been building that over the past like month or so. And that should, tell, you know, we don't like talking about dates, but it, that this is one that I'm pretty <laughs> pretty comfortable saying that that should go live. We're, we're planning on doing, uh, depending on when this, when this gets published, we're planning on doing a uh, our first credit Cardano Mint uh, next week. So depending on when you're viewing this, it may already be live and available. You're having way too much fun there, aren't you? Yeah, it's a very good time. I, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it's the best place I've ever worked. We do really cool stuff. Everyone is good at their job and everyone's just crazy nice and supportive. It's an amazing place to work that's reflected, I think, by the community that has rallied around it where, um, you know, what we call it because the, the Gutenberg Bible was the first book that we minted. 
sort of to commemorate the the printing press. The printing press first printed the Gutenberg Bible. And so that was sort of a, a, a thematic thing that was done there. And so folks that hold the Gutenberg Bible have access to a special Discord channel. Um, and so for those that the term for has been like OGs, like the original Gutenberg people. Um, and so uh, if you go, if anybody goes and you, you join the, the OG channel, you'll see it's just this incredibly positive and supportive place where folks are constantly helping each other out. Um, and like uh, they're doing like trades with each other or helping each other find things or answering questions. And um, it's just a really, really cool and positive environment that is both internal to the company and external to the community that has uh, been built around it. And I'm, I'm so pumped for BookCon to meet some of these folks in, in, in person. Um, and I love every time that I get to go down to the office and, and see um, some of my coworkers and friends from Book. It's, it's a really great place, man. It's a, it's a good time. Very cool indeed. Now, uh, we're running out of time to go through all these other things, but um, uh, I do wanted to touch on the uh, the ITO, the mm -hmm. initial token offering sure. that you guys yep. had last year, and then move yep. on to the stake pool that you guys have now as sure. well. So yeah. there's this whole book token, the actual token itself in the economy here. Uh, so we can touch on this uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah. So... Uh uh, it, that, that's it's a very loaded and open-ended question. There's a lot there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so what is. I would say is, so let, let me let me preface it by this. I'll talk about a couple of different things, but um, I think for folks that want to learn more about the token and what it is and its utility and stuff like that, Ben and Josh with RJ did a very good job of writing up a white paper that sort of explains all of this stuff and talks about the utility and how many tokens there are and what, you know, and what it's used for. Uh, and that white paper, you know, is obviously free and, and on our website and you can see it. But since we are a book company, we also minted the white paper and it's a DEA that you can actually read uh, in the reader and have in your wallet. Um, and uh, yeah, if folks want a copy, hit me up on Twitter and I'll send someone, uh, we can do something <laughs> like that. So maybe do something fun when this comes out. We'll do like, uh, we'll give away some some white papers or something. Yeah, but, yeah we'll, we'll do a giveaway. I'll, I'll do it at the end of the video. There we go. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Do a giveaway and then I'll send somebody, uh, let's, say, let's say let's say two different people, I'll send them like uh, white papers. Um, but so um, anyway, but at, at the very high level, um, the token, the, the book token can be used for a few things. I think two of the most interesting things are, the first one is it's something that can be used as a functional currency within the ecosystem. So we've already done now uh, multiple times where when you're minting a book, instead of minting and paying with ADA, you can pay with book token. We already support that. And so really, you think about the, we're talking about the payment engine. We're just now adding an additional currency because you've already had the ability to mint in a chain's native currency, then in book token. Now we're adding fiat with credit cards. But book token allows people to do that. In the future, we want to make it that... Um, especially when we have like the self-minting portal and stuff like that for independent authors, that they could potentially pay some of the fees of registration and stuff. They could pay that in book token or maybe folks that uh, buy books in book token and buy it in a discount relative to the exchange rate to ADA. But the other piece that's interesting is uh, when we're going to launch this year, the plan is we're going to launch the read to earn program. And so if I'm not mistaken from the tokenomics standpoint, 50% of all tokens, it's roughly, it's, it's a very high number. You can check the, the white paper in the comments down below. Correct me if my numbers are off once you get the white paper. <laughs> but um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 50% of all book tokens that are going to be minted um, or rather that go into circulation are for the read to earn program. And the way that read to earn works is it's quite literally as you're reading the ebook and you're going through it, you're, you're earning book token just for reading your book. And so uh, it's interesting how uh, Josh is a really cool way that he kind of phrases it where it's this notion of like, like a proof of work, right? Where uh, like, you know, we have a proof of work server, like mining Bitcoin or something. Um, but you're doing a proof of work and the work is your mind reading a book, right? And like, as you're actually doing the work of reading the book, you're being rewarded and getting a book token for doing it. So it's a really, really cool concept. Um, yeah. And it's a really fun one that, that is the, the way that they phrase it that I think is dead on is that it, in, it incentivizes knowledge and incentivizes learning, right? Like you already have this book that you wanted to read anyway, and now you have an additional financial incentive because you literally get paid uh, for every page that you read. I think that uh, term that Josh gave me was knowledge mining. And I, yep, that's, know, what that, that's, that's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. That sat with me for ages. Yep. I absolutely yep. loved it. You know, Proof of work, knowledge mining. Learning. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so, so the ITO, so the, to fully round off and answer your question, the ITO was the opportunity for folks who believed in the project to buy book token at a discount. And then once that finished, the book stake pool uh, is an opportunity where similar in the sense of like how ISOs and ISPOs, you know, back in the day, like folks that would for projects that were about to launch, um, 
you know, we, we, I don't know what's a term that we've used for it, but it's not quite accurate, right? Because it's not an initial thing. It's not like we're going to launch a product. The product is already functioning. It's much more of like, if you talk to like Ben and Josh, it's much more like, yeah, some of these projects they're doing like, Hey, let's get some bootstrap funds to do whatever. For us, we view the stake pool in a similar mechanism to ISO, but much more for like, Hey, if you're a believer in the project, this helps to, to fund our continuing operational expenses to pay employee salaries and continue, as we say, like building the future of books. Right. And so it's, it's not a thing that like, Hey, this ISO is going to run for three months. And then from there, that's the bootstrapping funds. And that's it. The idea is that it is a continual additional revenue. It's, it's a, the idea is for it to be a symbiotic thing where it's an additional revenue stream for the company from people that are supporters of the project. And then for folks that delegate to the pool, um, the, I think the margin is like 99%. We keep the ADA, but you get the equivalent uh, book token with uh, a bonus of currently, I think the bonus is a 10% to the market rate of what you would have gotten if you went to like a DEX and swapped it out. So for folks that are interested in acquiring more book token, you can delegate to the book stake pool. And then you get, uh, and actually through uh, the claiming mechanism for that, we've done through Sunday labs, which I've known Pi and that team for a long time. And they're very, very good at what they do. And, uh, they did a while back when they had their, um, they had their ISO and they were uh, releasing their Sunday tokens. Um, they built a claiming portal and now they have basically, now they offer it as a, as a product that people can do. And so we partnered with them and they built our claiming portal. So you delegate to the book pool, uh, you are rewarded a certain amount of book tokens, you go to this claiming portal and you just get those tokens and you can claim them whenever you want. There's no expiration on them or anything. It's um, yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty cool process and it's, it's come together very seamlessly. Um, it was great working with the Sunday folks. I've known Pi for a while and it was great to be able to like actually work together. I've had them on my channel and I've interviewed them about the stuff they were doing. And I love their project for a long time. And it was cool to be able to like, when we were talking about, well, how are we going to make it that folks can like claim this stuff? It was cool to be like, Hey, I know a guy. And they built a thing. Why don't we just work with them? So that was so that was fun. And, and to your point, I guess, as we're rounding off our conversation, to your point about how we've all had these long, circuitous journeys in the ecosystem. We've all done lots of different things. It's funny meeting Pi through the channel and interviewing him on his stuff. And now I'm in a position where like, hey, we should work together. You guys do good stuff. And so uh, we worked together on that. We hope to do a couple more things with them. But um, yeah, so that's sort of the ITO, the stake pool, and then how somebody would claim it uh, using the portal built by Sunday Labs. I'll put links down below to the white paper and the book IO state pool as well. So if anyone's interested, you can get more information about that and actually delegate to the pool to potentially get some of those uh, book tokens as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they can sit in your wallet and they can do some really cool things and uh, be um, a part of the ecosystem in general. Is there anything else that we need to know about that's coming up on the roadmap or anything else that uh, you guys are holding out on us that uh, you can talk about? I think the, the biggest thing I'll mention just at a high level without going into too much detail, we've talked about a lot of the, of the stuff. And I, and I think, so, so two things. The first one is like to end the conversation, how we started it, our next big goal is mass adoption and easy onboarding of folks. So what we call like the mom test, Ben always says, when, ben always mm -hmm. says when my mom can come and easily buy and consume a book, that's where we want to get to. And so what you're going to see is all the things we're releasing here in the future are all moving in that direction of how we make this at the end of the day, a best in class, not just like a proof of concept, but a best in class web two experience that just happens to be powered by blockchain and not the other way around, right? Something that like all the benefits and features that you get, oh, it turns out that's living on a blockchain somewhere, yeah. but folks yeah. don't need to know what that is. So that is the biggest focus that you'll see from us over the coming year on how we do that. And then just from a, one piece that we just haven't talked about at all, I think it's worth mentioning is um, that we have iteratively been releasing uh, new updates to both our iOS and Android applications. And if you haven't seen those in a while, um, we hired, again, best people that you can find, a absolute incredible um, Android developer to, to lead our Android team and an iOS developer to lead our iOS team and completely rewrote both of our applications. And Ooh, okay. uh, we have... Yeah, I mean, from scratch, we had a, what's, if you know code, we had a React Native application that was sort of to both platforms. And RJ and I said, let's just find really good iOS and Android developers. And those guys replicated and surpassed the functionality of that app in like two months or something. And so now it's just off to the races and adding all kinds of cool stuff. And so what you can already expect to see from that in the next couple of weeks, actually, by BookCon is we're going to have um, audiobooks for the first time now on the mobile application. Um, social login will be there, which we were just talking about. And then also um, the introduction of the first steps towards offline mode with some caching that's happening in the background to make sure you have an uninterrupted uh, listening experience for your audiobooks. Um, 
but the, the thing is that that very much goes with our whole mass adoption uh, mindset where in order to get there, the way that folks want to consume their books is on their mobile device. And we want to make, like RJ always says, not just a mobile app that is a proof of concept that it can be done, but a best in class that is the same or better of an experience that you would get on a competing platform like Amazon or Apple. So um, yeah, I think it's probably a good place to, to leave it. Um, Definitely. Continually just trying to polish things off and make them uh, the best that they can possibly be and make the experience one that people genuinely enjoy using that just happens to be living on blockchain technology. Right. This has been amazing sitting down with you and chatting through uh, yeah. not only everything in the Book.io ecosystem, but also learning a little bit more about yourself as well. So, uh, Guillermo, thank you so much for joining me on this episode and talking through everything Book.io. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on this episode. Uh, Pete, the, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, like I said, been a huge fan of the channel for a very long time. Uh, I have the song Learn Cardano podcast playing in my head, you know, <laughs> like on and off, like, you know, it just pops into my head every now and then. So a uh, very big fan of the channel. Really glad to be here with you and uh, can't wait to see you in person again, hopefully at uh, a rare in Las Vegas. Awesome. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll speak again soon. Yeah, thanks. So if you're interested in getting one of those white paper books from the Book.io team, just leave a comment down below and I will put you into the draw for winning one of them. It's a, a nice way, especially if you're brand new to the ecosystem and haven't received one before, uh, to get something and experience what that entire platform is like. You can connect your wallet up, get that book, and then start reading it through their platform as well. All the links and references down below for you guys. So if you want to learn more about the Book.io ecosystem and everything else around the token as well all there for you and like always if you enjoyed this podcast episode make sure you give me that thumbs up hit that like button helps with the algorithm hit subscribe click on the notification bell and i'll see you in the next video yeah, yeah, gotta do it like that you've been listening to the learn cardano podcast